on the necessity of Dionysius, the return of Hephaestus as a tale of the god that alone can solve unresolvable conflicts and restore an inconsistent whole. And for those of you that want to go further, here is the book from which the lecture comes, Dionysius and Politics, Constructing Authority in the Greek and Roman World. So that's a real proper Oxford type presentation. Uh, Darius, it's a delight to have you here. Uh, and I'd like to invite you to come up to the podium and speak to the colleagues here and the colleagues online. Thank you so much. John, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for a kind invitation and the occasion to, uh, to share uh, certain remarks on uh, today in that very moving, um, very moving uh, lecture from Afghanistan. We've heard about uh, myths in the role, in the negative role, in the role of, say, consolidating the opposite sides uh, and, say, rationalizing the uh, cruelty. But uh, I realize um, that uh, I know a story coming from Greek religion I'm uh, working a lot uh, with, uh, which is a story exactly uh, dedicated for the center for the resolution of intractable conflict, because it's precisely a myth uh, on that how to, uh, how to deal with intractable conflict. And uh, in the deep level of that myth is the information which show us a philosophical, ontological, and epistemological assumptions, uh, which I think it's worth to discuss uh, uh, on that. Uh, when, it, when it comes to Dionysus, uh, we always uh, say uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. So let me start with some remarks on that uh, topic. It appears that the uh, over a coming of the Nietzschean conception of Dionysus, which uh, Cornelia Iller Kerenny once called a modern mythology, uh, has now become a fact, which has occurred, if not in philosophy and uh, the social sciences, then certainly in the field of history of religion. The fascinating for several generations of scholars picture of mad barbaric anti-political god of myth is being replaced by a picture much closer to historical reality of a protector of a police, a god whose cult unites and strengthens the order of a political community. The change of paradigm is so drastic that we can worry whether the new view will not lose sight of the indubitable foreignness of a god whose paradoxical wisdom earned him a mantle of a god of madness, of a god whose action may consolidate order and give peace, but can also destroy those who, like the daughters of Minias or Proetus, will reject the calling to abandon their roles and question the absolute character of the principle that bind the police. It seems to me that the right road to answering the question about the political role of Dionysus is not through minimizing the cult of alterity, foreignness and madness clearly visible in the myth, but in the attempt to understand why the paradoxical god of wine and his seemingly anarchic calling can favor the preserving consolidation and even strengthening the police. Uh, it, in, 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 in this speech, I will concern myself with a story that it seems to me can be acknowledged as a type of mythological explanation of this puzzle, that is the history of a God's intervention that saved off the conflict between Hephaestus and Hiram. And as consequence, saved an Olympus torn apart by a feud. It is a success of a great measure, Dionysus overcomes one of the most serious crises of the world of a god. It is in fact, it's a fact that in Attic painting from the first half of the sixth century before Christ, this is the only theme where Dionysus plays a central role. Uh, a fact allows us to suppose that the story played an important role in the forming of theology of Semelisson. But did it play the same role in the forming of the Dionysian political theology? In fact, it would be difficult to point to a different mythical source of hope, 
for writing the relation between the order of the polis and the strange demands of the met god. The status of a myth is confirmed by the fact that it was the subject of the first of the sixth painting that uh, Pausanias saw in the holy circle of Dionysus near the theater of a salt and slope of Athenian Acropolis. The traveler wrote, uh, quote, within the precincts are two temples and two status of Dionysus the Eleutheros, deliverer, and uh, the one Alcmenes made of ivory and gold. There are paintings here, Dionysus bringing Hephaestus up to heaven. One of the Greek legends is that Hephaestus, when he was born, was thrown down by Hera. In revenge, he sent as a gift a golden chair with invisible fetters. When Hera sat down, she was held fast, and Hephaestus refused to listen to any other of the gods save Dionysus. In him, he reposed the fullest trust, and after making him drunk, after making him, him drunk, Dionysus brought him to heaven. The Dionysian retinue with drunk Hephaestus carried upon the back of Itifalic mull, a popular topic of vast painting, remind us a completely different side of Dionysus than the one we know from the myths of conflict featuring rebellious kings and believers who have rejected the call, well known from Euripides Bacher. Mm -hmm. uh, the place of the patron of an anarchic rebellion or the merciless avengers instead occupied by a god, uh, quote, in the role of keeper of the order of Zeus uh, and pacifier, unquote, as Cornelia Kerani put it in her fascinating study. The effect of a god, uh, if one sub submits to him, brings peace and returns disturbed order. The scholar writes the following about the scene of the return of Hephaestus represented upon a famous black figure crater, so-called Francois Vase from the sixth century before Christ. The oldest no realization of this theme. Uh, quote, to understand the image, we need to avoid modern simplification, considering Hira's rank in the cosmic order. Her liberation cannot have been a purely comic episode, but a crucial event for the stability of the order. In this context, the role of Dionysus, who placed as places the painter, uh, placed intentionally at the center of a scene, is implied. His task is to reunite the disowned son with his mother and reclaim Hira's dignity as a queen. Dionysus was responsible not only for returning peace to family, but for the re-establishment of a divine order." Unquote. The accounts of the mythographers confirm the accuracy of this observation. The theme of chaos and division creeping into the world of the gods plays a substantial role from the very beginning of Hephaestus's history. The fact that his birth was accompanied by dispute and rage is said bluntly by Hesiod in his Theogony. The violation of a divine order is signaled, it seems, by both the problematic question of Zeus's fatherhood, in one variation of the myth Hera conceived Hephaestus by herself, and the deformity of a god, which is also a situation which shows a kind of a crisis. Judging by Plato's reaction, the scandalous momentum of this conflict places it in the category of some of the most disturbing pictures in ancient mythology. In the Republic, the philosopher recalls it as one of the two standard bearing examples of stories harmful to the police, public morality and the right for my formation of youth. In other words, it is one of the reasons why myths along with their creators should be expelled from the state worthy of recognition by philosophers. The continuation of the crisis is confirmed by the news of a suffering of a child abandoned at Lemnos and the loving care of the daughters of, um, 
Oceanus, Urinum, and Titis, who are attempting to replace his birth mother, Hera. It is easy to understand that Hephaestus' uh, revenge by way of sending a gift in the form of a special throne trap as a desire to even the accounts can be grasped as an attempt to measure out and restore justice. This attempt, as we know, works in the opposite way intended and only increases the scale of existing chaos. Justice can be measured, but it cannot be restored. The scale of stasis, the depth of the split dividing him and the house of the gods is illustrated by a scene in which Hephaestus not only refused the release of Hera, thereby going against the royal dignity, but also reject a sacred in the eyes of a Greek's obligation of a son towards his parents. pseudo hyginus writes that when Vulcan receives the request to refrain from revenge, he answers in anger that he has no mother. There follows a series of unsuccessful attempts at resolving the conflict. This stage, let's call it pre dionysian moves toward restoring order through the restoration of the Olympian Ars. I mean, understood Ars understood as a power and principle together. Thus, essentially towards the one-sided capitulation of Hephaestus. The failure of this approach seems very eloquent because it demonstrates an erroneous definition of a goal and the inadequacy of the methods for solving such a conflict as this. It is a conflict whose parties represent incommensurable reasons and therefore uh, irreducible to any common scale. This is a situation uh, that is tragic par excellence. There on the one side, we have the pain of a harmed child and on the other, the drama of anarchy. On the one side, the scandal of injustice and on the other, the scandal of disobedience. Although the attempt at the solution is served by a whole arsenal of political means, it has a misery council war, it does not facilitate the taking into account of Hephaestus's claim. Pausanias simply writes that Hephaestus did not want to show obedience to any of the gods. The goal of this intervention is clear. I'm still talking about that pre-Dionysian uh, uh, part. They are concerned with the full submission of Hephaestus to the will of a god. A similar assumption is confirmed by account of Libanius, who informs us that the god of war, Ares, Ares become engaged in the resolution of the conflict. How it comes? The council of the gods um, convinced that only Hephaestus is capable of freeing his mother, gathers to discuss the question of his return to heaven. Eris uh, takes the initiative since nobody else has any ideas for resolving the conflict. War seems to be the only way of returning order, the only way to return order. However, the Ares intervention ends with spectacular failure, which will always haunt him with an air of infamy thereby precisely outlining the limits of the effective powers of this god. The companion of um, Ares, Daimos Phobos, to pers personification of fear and Credonus, dean of battle, confirmed that uh, Hephaestus was not afraid of a god of war. Instead, Ares was frightened, as Libanius relates, and fled terrified by a uh, torches of Vulcan. The efforts of a god come to note. In the work of restoring order, both peaceful means, council and diplomacy, and the uh, arcana of war turn out to be useless. The triumph of Dionysus becomes unintelligible if we forget about all this. On the Francois vase, the painter Cleitus represents Ares humiliated by defeat on the peripheries of the monumental scene of Hephaestus's return. The god of war, kneeling in full armor, shamefully hides behind the fronts of Olympus's ruler. 
Athena, standing next to him, sneers at him, pointing toward the triumphal procession of a god of wine, who, assisted by Silene, brings drunk Hephaestus to face Zeus and Hera. The figure of crouched Ares reminds that the intervention of Dionysus took place after a all um, available means had been exhausted. In the frame of previous action, the matter proved to be impossible to resolve within the frame of the actions previously undertaken. Only Dionysus, who gets the grief-stricken got drunk, succeeds in averting the crisis, that is by bringing Hephaestus from Lemnos to Olympus and leading him to reconcile with his mother. How does Dionysus achieve that other gods could not? We don't, we don't know, precisely speaking. The accounts of mythographers known to us are extremely restrained. They limit themselves to the lapidary information that the god make him drunk with wine. Despite this restraint, it would be difficult to see the matter as insignificant. It would be good to remember that it is after this adventure that Dionysus is admitted, just after that adventure, that Dionysus is admitted to the circle of the Olympian gods. Just so we are not misled by the story's uh, coarseness. And he's admitted not as a one of a divine servant, but, but as one of the 12. This is very important information. The fact that it is then that a second class god, the only one in this group who is a son of a mortal mother, closes the list of the greatest gods can also be understood to mean that only after accepting Dionysus does Olympus as a picture of divine harmony gain its final form. Without Dionysus, the order of the gods would be incomplete or even, as the myth suggests, impossible. In what way then does the laconic made him drunk with wine shed light upon the role of Bacchus in the divine order of the world? To explain what lack Dionysus fills out, we should ponder why, what other gods did, could not succeed in doing what the son of Semele was able to do. Why does being drunk with wine make possible restoring the unity torn apart by discord? Did Dionysus offer a previously unknown type of order, some new perspective that permits the harmonization of contradiction? We know nothing about any of that. Upon what then does the power of salvic intoxication depend? Why and in what sense can drunkenness restore agreement and the tragic discord and bond? If we accept that the coarse and comic rope of the myth express significant meaning, that it's worth it to treat it seemingly frivolous history serious, seriously. However, this does not mean recasting the story into a bloodless allegory, but to see where it will take us if we take it seriously without dismissing beforehand that it says something important about the world of uh, gods and the men, not despite of its causelessness, but precisely through it. Since the episode is concerned with the god of wine, then submersion in everyday life should be not surprising. It's true that the mythographers are restrained, but does that mean that they are hiding some mystery? But maybe the thing simply does not require additional explanation because the story is so obvious and universally known. If so, we should look for it in the genre specific potential of a scene, in the dialogue of a coarse voices warmed with white, in the circulating imaginings caused by the soft power of the cup filled with wine, with tempers, anger filled, disputes resolve otherwise irresolvable conflicts. If we agree that Dionysus is wine, Enos, as Greek called him, then uh, Enos, a uh, uh, Polish pronunciation of Greek and um, British is completely different. That's a funny thing. <laughs> we have the same with Latin. Yeah. That's, uh, when you listen 
Yes. Uh, if we agree that uh, Dionysus is um, Inos, then without a great risk, we can also accept that the action of wine in some sense is in some sense analogical to the effects of a God's presence. It is a backbreaking task uh, that goes way beyond a historian's workshop, but I think it's worth the risk. Without getting stuck in the course details, without escaping into Padless abstraction, let us attempt to see what theological, ontological, epistemological, and finally political meaning is carried by the image of Dionysus who unites the world. When we seek answers to the question as to what happened during the Council of the Gods, everything that was said about the Saldic effect of a god and his gift comes to mind, that is everything that is that the picture of Oinos ties to the healing of carries, bringing people together, liberation, agreement, peace, friendship, and love. There is plenty of this. The flip side of the horror accompanying the God in the conflictual myths is after all countless, coming from Homer and Hesios witnesses, tying to the God and wine with the bright side of human life. As Homer Zeus confessed, his son begotten of Semele is a source of joy for mortals. With all the reservation, Homer has no doubt that wine is a divine drink and that the wine is a gift of the, and the vine is a gift of the earth. Hesiod calls him joyous in his Theogony and in the days and walks repeats this description in the context of observation about the grape harvest. Very early in the Greek literature, there appears the obvious anyway observation that the gift of Dionysus is a kind of a medicine Pharmacon, which uh, soothes worries, gives comfort, uh, frees from suffering, and lets you forget about misfortunes. Quote, uh, low Bacchus, the best of all medicines is to get drunk of wine, unquote, remind us Alcius. Thanks to Dionysus disappear pain, woes, sadness, and worries, and their place is taken by the desire of dance and love. It is possible to doubt that the God's gift bring together and unites people, lovers, tension melts the ice. Not really. Wine, says Plata, quote, softens and suits characters so that it tries to mutual unity and friendship, unquote. This is obvious. However, in the connection of uh, Inos, of wine, to peace, we can find deeper levels than the banal and not always true, statement that wine suits customs and judgments which Dionysus accomplishes as a patron of joy and certain social gatherings. The God whose calling, like his gift, ignores social differences, puts in brackets hierarchies and dependencies, the God who questions the apparent indisputability of the reasons, justifying conflicts and wars, gets into a fundamental dispute, a dispute about what is reasonable and what wisdom is. Dionysus says Euripides is a God who loves peace and equally without regard for wealth distributes the joy of drinking wine without worries and shows himself to be an ardent enemy, ardent enemy of false wisdom. A quotation from Bakker, quote, he hates the one who does not care about this, to lead a happy life by day and friendly night, and to keep his wise mind and intellect away from over curious men. In the sarcasm directed at the over curious, uh, there lies, it seems to me, the key to the question of wisdom, which Dionysus recommends to the Thebans in the Bach. The same, it seems, wisdom that allows Dionysus to end the conflict between Hephaestus and Hera. Then what would be the wisdom to which the God calls, the wisdom of being drunk? The history of Hephaestus uh, lets us accept that what is reasonable in the Dionysian sense is what leads to the bonding of the world, not what is marked by the unity of reason but the bonding of the world. The antinomy of rational, irrational in the Dionysian sense of this world 
corresponds to the tension between the whole and the part, between what integrates and what divides. What is not included in the story also seems important uh, in the history about Hephaestus. There is no final judgment deciding who was right and who, who was fought. And there is no sentencing that restores the disturbed order. There is no punishment and there is not even an attempt to explain the reasons of each one of the sides. They are absent in this order in which particular reasons, particular reasons move, as do the means available to them, because the conflict between Hira and Hephaestus is irresolvable. It's irresolvable. What Dionysus leads to is a de-escalation, not a resolution. I borrow from the language of um, political sciences uh, to stress that the matter at hand is not about resolution, which reinstitutes the whole as a consistent order, but as a state that makes coexistence possible for different reasons and perspectives. De escalation, a state engulfs a man whose members are warmed by wine makes it possible to break the impetus toward decomposition, maintain order and the wholeness of the world without making the verdict who won or who is right in the order of power, logic, and the law. If Hephaestus can return to Olympus, if the divine and human order lasts, if between periods of war and tension, periods of peace appear and the whole does not fall apart, then it's because coexistence based upon de-escalation is possible, because it's possible to moderate conflict independently of the logical or logical or political setting of a disputed matter, the evaluation of the whether mutual accusation are found and grievances independently of grievances and the scale of the injustice committed. Dionysus does not bring about a new order, does not grant that one side is right, as Athena does in Oresteia, but proposes a practical solution. However, this solution requires the previous acceptance of a fundamental thesis, the, the thesis of a tragic nature of a world. This is the ontological core of the myth of Hephaestus's return. Admittedly, history does not speak of this directly, but without the assumption that the dispute ended hopes for a perfect ordering of a whole, the metaphor of getting drunk as a remedy for stasis does not make sense. The whole can only be reborn thanks to the assumption that disorder belongs to the nature of reality, that the whole can only be brought back under the condition of abandoning the hope for full unification. The helplessness of a God's apparent in the first pre-Dionysian phase of Hephaestus' history illustrates and confirms these tests. The impossibility of bringing the whole world together under one arch, the one rule, is essential, so to say, in coherence or rather a tragic nature makes it so that efforts, efforts to recreate a whole free from disagreement, disobedience and conflicting reason must come to nothing. This is not exclusively about the obstinacy of the sides, bad will or impetuosity, but about a fundamental undecidability, about a conflict of incommensurate pers perspective, about a situation where as scandalized Plato recounts it in the Eutyphro that, quote, whatever is dear to Hephaestus is hated by Hera, that's unquote. This is why Dionysian wisdom of the whole cannot be the wisdom faithful to a reason, faithful to coherence and consistency. In the, say, human perspective, in the particular human perspective, of course. The acceptance of Dionysus to Olympus ceased to be an acceptance of this diagnosis. 
the truth about the tragic nature of the world. Even in periods of a relative harmony, there always smolders the possibility of conflict that is irreducible to a common measure for opinions about beauty or the good. There is always the possibility of situation in which all choices made in the particular logic of justice and reason will be bad. The acceptance of the God into company of the 12 seems to be an admission that the Dionysian uh, epoch, the ability to put into brackets conflict in reason is the condition sine qua non, if my Latin British is precise, uh, uh, of all <laughs> politics that take responsibility for the whole. Acknowledging that it is impossible to il eliminate the tragic, those in power, both human and Olympian, must be able to mitigate conflict and to reduce its consequences. Thank you very much.